I mean, living, limiting encounters is, is very, very important. So, you know, the rounds look totally different in that one person goes into the, every room uh, rather than, you know, 11, like it used to be. The students have all been sent home, of course. Um, in terms of specific things, what, you know, across the board, when the, the N95 respirator masks are so uh, precious. What we're doing now is covering them with disposable masks and, uh, and throwing the disposable one away to try to preserve the integrity of it. And then our engineers are coming up with a, a way for those to be sterilized. Um, so, you know, I, I couldn't emphasize more how much the PPE issue was uh, really had its hands around our throats. And uh, just now there's been some relief with uh, some, some uh, plane supplies from, uh, from China and from other places. Uh, but you, you're going to have to get really creative. Uh, and that segues into the aerosol of the laparoscopy. Um, it's presumed that it's, it's in there. And so we're using uh, gas retrievers on every case. But, you know, something's got to be escaping. And, uh, and that leads to the controversy of appendicitis. You know, a, a couple we did, we gave them antibiotics and sent them home the next day to limit the encounters. Others say, well, we normally operate on them and send them home from the recovery room. But I think the intubation and the aerosolization, if that's a word, just sound to me like they're more significant than having a kid in bed for a day. And so while we were biased against non-op uh, in the acute setting, we're, we're using it now. We're using yeah. it now. We think it limits encounters and others can, you know, can counter that. I did a pyloric today. We did it with the gas exchange uh, uh, system. We rigged it up. Uh, we do test everyone that's going to the OR unless it's life threatening and know their status in advance. And so our group just met today by web to say, if they're COVID positive, what should we do for appendicitis or for uh, pyloromyotomy? And we're sorting that out, but uh, we do want to know. And uh, testing has gone through a change every day at our institution of what, who's being tested, how they're being tested, um, I think it's just better for people to know because yeah. it's such an invisible monster that you, you don't, you know, nobody looks any different. Nobody, nobody's any sicker or not as sick. And, but we're operating on them and maybe exposing ourselves. So I'm sorry, I don't have definitive answers, but we're struggling with these things every day and trying to do the best we can. And I think just limiting encounters is the only thing we can do. That's, that's, we know works. Yeah. No, your answer is tremendous. How fast is your testing turnaround? It's, we're now down to eight hours. So you can theoretically uh, send off the test on, on almost anything. Almost anything. And you know, you today we had a, today they transferred up, up a one month old with a truly incarcerated hernia. And, you know, we treated them as if they were positive because that went right to the OR. But almost everything else, we got eight hours and... We just feel like we should know. And, and when you're positive, when you say a COVID positive in the OR, yeah. you are in 95 goggles or, or are you doing PAPRs? What, what's your, what's yeah, your OR using, positive protocol? We're using face shields. We're using the N95s. And, um, and anesthesia is intubating the patient in a negative uh, room which is not in the OR, it's right outside the OR. So it's like the old days of an ante room. Yeah. Uh, if they know they're positive, they're intubating them in the negative room. If they're not sure, we haven't had consistency yet. Yeah. And um, uh, by the way, as a tip, the, um, the sterilization, Nebraska's got a really slick system uh, for UV, UV towers sterilizing the N95 mask. Awesome. Yeah, sick your engineers on it. Yep. Um, Hey Adam, what, uh, I know you guys. You guys have done a ton of changes. Uh, yeah, I think I sent the um, protocol that our anesthesiologist came up with to Lauren to post in the uh, QSC toolkit. But we, um, just like Dr. Stilianos is saying, we 
uh, reinstituted having an induction room. So every patient going to the OR gets tested for COVID. Uh, our, so we stopped doing all elective cases, but um, you know, for the last year, our hospital has been uh, has canceled cases because of our aspergillus thing that you've probably read about. So we're really behind in terms of cases, but we're very, very familiar now with uh, ranking our cases by red, yellow, and green. So we're really only doing red level cases and um, and yellows, so things that have to get done. So anything that is what we, you know, in our elective world right now, which is essentially a yellow case that needs to get done within a week or two. So those are tumors and, you know, central lines for chemo, biopsies and things like that. Um, or bleeding, ulcerative colitis patients or, you know, anything like that. They're getting tested 48 hours before coming to the OR and they have to be negative before moving forward. All inductions are happening in an induction room. There is just a single anesthesiologist in the induction room in a capper papper type of environment. Uh, for any patient that's positive, we're waiting 30 minutes because that's what they have decided is the amount of time for any particles to settle before transitioning them to the operating room uh, and then doing the case and then reversing that where they're uh, extubating. So all aerosolized cases are being performed in that kind of maximal safety environment. Uh, patients, uh, like Dr. Stiliano said, were treating appendicitis. We had a bias against uh, antibiotics only, um, but we are treating some patients in that way. If they're COVID positive, anyone who is, uh, they all get tested for COVID if they're negative, uh, then it's surgeon preference. And many of us, because they can get out of the hospital same day, we're just operating and sending them home rather than having the 20-30% uh, recurrence and being have risking a longer hospitalization. And we're doing the same for other things that are in that appendicitis type of, uh, you know, space. Trying to limit any contact, minimize contact and minimize OR as much as possible. Okay. Um, no, it's, that's an amazing change of all sorts of stuff. And, you, and of course, neither of you guys are doing clinics, I'm, I'm guessing. We but looked, yeah, we looked at all of our clinics through the end of May and canceled basically all of them. We Each of us had maybe one or two patients that had to be seen. The rest are either telehealth, phone call uh, visits, um, or just delayed for another time. Yeah. And and same for you, Dr. Stilianos, no clinics, right? Correct. No on-site. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Mike, what, uh, uh, what are you guys doing? Uh, very similar. So basically, you know, all elective cases canceled. The Ohio governor had mandated um, that across the state. So it fell into a tiered system. Um, for cases that do have to go, are considered the essential cases. Um, it's very similar to what Adam was just describing, where we're doing intubation in a separate room. There's minimal personnel that one or two anesthesiologists, uh, ideally negative pressure room. The transport to the patient, we're basically completely bypassing the pre-op holding area now. They just come straight to into, back into the ORs. Um, and exactly as Steve was saying, kind of minimizing any touch points within the hospital. Um, intubation is done, again, with really no one else in the room. Uh, waking up also in a negative pressure room. Uh, as soon as they wake up and get extubated and get a face mask on, whether they're COVID positive or not, we're just assuming that most people are. Um, our turnaround time for tests is not down to eight hours. We're still sitting at 12 hours. And what we've come across now is an acute uh, shortage of the nasal swabs, which I think is sitting in other areas too, but um, they're really starting to limit who we can actually, who we can actually test. So we have not tested, gone to testing everyone coming to the OR just because we don't just limited capability yeah. the capacity <clears throat> you know it's changing so fast we we the announcement came out today that uh, we will not be testing children for the routine respiratory viral panel and yeah keeping, we and keeping same thing for us yeah and keeping the swabs for the uh for the covid it's um and it's such a moving target every day um you know, official announcements come out and they're very different than the day before, but they're, they're doing the best that they can. Uh, yeah. Try to keep well, us safe. And, and for us, the, you know, the testing restrictions is, is the swab availability and, and we've got them, but 
you know, it's certainly one of those supply things that's that we're worried about. Um, yeah. And and it certainly limits the you know the the amount of tests that we can do. Um, uh, Samir, how about you guys? Especially in the in the ICU, have have what's changed that's clinically different? I think we've definitely had testing limitations. Uh, um, in terms of the ICU, I think uh, um, you know we don't we don't have any major changes to report. We've uh, We've done some of the same stuff that's been described in terms of the operating room, in terms of waiting uh, after intubation, not having people in there, and then um, uh, in terms of PPE, similar type of things, treating everybody as if they had it. Okay. Uh, it, we'd be definitely interested in like filtration system around like laparoscopy because of the SAGES recommendations around um, you know, potential for viral mm. particle spread with laparoscopy and yeah. um, during like CO2 release. Yeah. I sent the file over earlier, so that might be um, around. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, by the way, um, uh, Samir, Dr. Stilianos also get, has these uh, great ECMO protocols and, and we'll share and those will uh, ultimately get up on the, um, uh, on the web as, as well. Uh, I don't know, has, has ECMO for you guys changed or is it the same? Uh, so we have a universal like, you know, uh, centralized system of who ends up getting ECMO, uh, but we've basically reserved it for, uh, for in terms of COVID uh, for younger patients, uh, minimal comorbidities, uh, single system, single organ dysfunction. Uh, the, the rates of success with ECMO and COVID at least so far, haven't been very high. It's like 10, 15%. And so uh, we've been relatively um, conservative about use of ECMO. Uh, but at the same time, many of them have responded to um, just standard measures in terms of ventilator management. 